If you would stand for the reading of God's word. We're gonna be reading from Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. This is coming from the message translation. That's why when I heard of the solid trust you have in the master Jesus and your outpouring of love to all the followers of Jesus, I couldn't stop thanking God for you. Every time I prayed, I'd think of you and give thanks. But I'd do more than thank, I'd ask. I'd ask the God of our master, Jesus Christ, the God of glory to make you intelligent and discerning and knowing him personally. Your eyes focused and clear so that you can see exactly what he is calling you to do. Grabs the immensity of this glorious way of life he has for his followers. Oh, the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him endlessly, endless energy, boundless strength. All this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from death and set him on a throne in deep heaven in charge of running the universe. Everything from galaxies to governments, no name and no power exempt from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He is, he is in charge of it all, has the final word on everything. At the center of all of this, Christ rules the church. The church you see is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts by which he fills everything with his presence. This, my brothers and sisters, is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I wasn't gonna make you stand up the whole sermon. A couple of y'all got nervous. I am so grateful uh, to have you with us today. I am Jennifer Lusher. Uh, I know that uh, I look a little bit like Pastor Ben, but I am not him. He is my brother, but I am not him. And so he is uh, just taking a, a time away um, this weekend. And so he tapped me on the shoulder and, and asked that I step in for him. And so I'm humbled to do that. I grew up, if you don't know me very well yet, I still am getting to know a lot of people. I grew up on the dirt roads of Alabama. Okay, nobody said roll tide. We getting better. We getting better every Sunday. Okay. Uh, I'm the wife of Sean and the mother of Lucas and belly and the baby Lily. And so, yeah, thanks be to God. And so I am blessed to serve here at Christ Church as one of its pastors. And so I don't wanna go too far without noting that today, I don't know if you've heard, but today is Mother's Day. And so I wanna take a moment and recognize our mothers. Churches around the country uh, are gonna be filled with pulpits, mainly with my brothers preaching to women about how to be moms, <laughs> which is ironic but also fitting because there are so many women in the Bible worthy of a Sunday. There's so many women in the Bible worthy of a Sunday. We can start with the first mother named Eve. We have a lot to thank her for, don't we women? We have a lot to thank her for. And, and, we, can, <laughs> and we can go on to, uh, to Isaac, the, the, the mother of Isaac, Sarah. We can go on to Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, Rebecca who birthed sibling rivalry and Jacob and Esau. We can go on to think and, and think about Rachel, the mother of Joseph and Ruth, who gets to be the mother of David and Hannah, who prayed so long and received Samuel. And then we go into the New Testament and we have Elizabeth, who is the mother of JTB, as I like to call him, John the Baptist. <laughs> and of course we have Mary, who is the mother of Jesus. If it wasn't for Jesus on my side, I don't know where I would be. So we could take time. And one of my favorites is Eunice, who is the mother of Timothy and how she raised him as a single mom and all the, what that meant to the church in the life of Timothy. So mothers aren't just worthy of a Sunday, they're worthy of a sermon series. Amen. <laughs> Somebody said, come on. <laughs> and mothers are worthy of a class and a study. And so we, wanted, we, we want to honor that. And I also want to say that today is not going to be a traditional Mother's Day sermon. And that's also because Mother's Day is a very tricky holiday. It's a time of sadness for some because they've lost their moms. It's a time of sadness for some moms because they've lost their children. 
It's a time of sadness for women who are unable to have children. I, I know of specific sisters who don't join us on Mother's Day because it's a tricky Sunday. And so we wanna honor moms and we wanna honor those women and it's a little bit difficult. But I promise you, I'm gonna honor you today if you're a mom, I'm gonna honor you by getting you out of this church service before the buffet at Ryan's fills up or Olive Garden, right? Or something fancy like Applebee's, right? <laughs> I'm gonna get y'all out of here before that goes. And I also wanna acknowledge, this has been a very interesting week. News broke about the repeal of Roe v. Wade. And I think a lot of people have a lot of feelings about that. I want you to know we're not tone deaf to that. We understand that there's a lot of conversations happening in our country. I believe God calls us to preach different sermons at different times. Sometimes our sermons can be evangelistic. Sometimes our sermons can be uh, biblical and, and expositional and exegetical. That's verse by verse, scripture by scripture. And sometimes God calls us to preach a prophetic message. And I do earnestly believe in this moment, in this season, we need to be speaking prophetically about what's happening, but the best way to speak prophetically is to be biblical. And the best way to be biblical is to read the Bible. And since most of us statistically aren't reading the Bible, that's what we're gonna do today, amen? And so we're gonna continue into Ephesians. Uh, and so before we go, let's pray, if you would, and bow your heads with me. Lord, thank you so much for our time together. Thank you for an opportunity to come before your throne. God, I pray as we sojourn through scripture together in these next few moments, that you would help us to hear your word, help us to apply to our hearts, and help us to move out of this space looking more like your son, loving more like your son, especially to a hurt and dying world. Lord, grant me clarity of mind and concision of speech and conviction to speak your truth. Hide me behind your word. May the seed of your word fall on good ground, take root and produce good fruit. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, amen. And just before I recap, I do wanna take just one more moment and just wanna honor my sister Lisi, who is joining us today and what God has done and is doing in her life. We are so glad to have you back with us. I definitely think often that I stand on your shoulders for the many years that you fill this space. And so I just wanna say thank you and honor you in this moment. And, and all the other mothers, I wanna honor you as well. And just as a recap, so far we've been in our series, Ephesians, and Pastor Ben walked us through what it means to be believers who are rooted in Christ, who know who we are in Christ. And then last week he focused on Ephesians 1, 11 through 14, where he unpacked how the God of Father has given us more than just information. The Holy Spirit has provided more than just a demonstration, and the Holy Spirit gives us an experience, a spiritual transformation. And that brings us to Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. I do wanna note that Pastor Ben spent two Sundays on 14 verses. So you guys know that we're going pretty deep with that. And just for proper context, as he's told us, uh, Ephesians is written around 62 AD while Paul is imprisoned in Rome. And the backdrop of this is that this city worshiped the God of Artemis. She was the protector of women and childbirth and they, she was believed to be the founder of that city. Her worship was so linked with that city that the political and business structures were tied in. The city officials were also the priest of her temple. And so Paul shows up in the midst of this preaching about a new king, a resurrected king, and you can see why that causes some issues. And so he wants to encourage the church. And I always say that the Bible specifically is written for a particular audience at a particular time for a specific purpose. But there is something in this word for us today. So I wanna talk a little bit today about keeping a focused perspective. Look at your neighbor, mama's gonna get nervous. Look at your neighbor and say, keeping a focused perspective. If this was golfing, that would have been great. Look at your neighbor and tell them, keeping a focused perspective. If you uh, are a mom and if you have a toddler, you have experienced this. You have left your phone behind and when you come back, you have 800,000 pictures because your toddler has just started snapping, right? 
And whenever Lucas, and last time I preached, I did not recognize him. So, hey, Lucas, I'm glad that you're here with us this Sunday. Uh, whenever Lucas gets my telephone, I pick it up and there's all these pictures and they're out of focus. None of it makes sense. Sometimes there's a picture of a refrigerator leg. Sometimes there's a sp- picture of a dog tail, but it is not in focus, right? He tries his best, but it's not in focus. And when we lose focus of what is happening, when we lose a perspective, a focus of what God is doing and what God is saying, it can sometimes look like those pictures that my son takes. And so that leads us to today, because I think that's part of Paul's focus in this text. So let's start with verse 15 and 16 and we'll walk our way through. This is Paul's introduction to his prayer. It says, that's why when I heard of the solid trust you have in the master Jesus, in your outpouring of love to all the Christians, I couldn't stop thanking God for you. Every time I prayed, I'd think of you and give thanks. For Paul, faith in Christ leads unavoidably in love for others. So if you are in Christ, One of the key markers of who you are is that you should be known as someone who loves. Paul is not saying he's not this super echelon Christian. He's not saying that he prays at all times. What he's saying is he prays regularly. And before I could go any farther, I had to stop myself and say, who is it that I'm praying regularly for in my life? If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, and there's not a list of persons or the church or an entity that you're praying regularly for, I would question how rooted we are in Christ, specifically in Paul's purview. Who can I say that I'm praying for regularly? In verses 17 through 19, it's Paul's intercession. He says, but I do more than thank. I ask the God of our master, Jesus Christ, the God of glory to make you intelligent and discerning and knowing him personally your eyes focused and clear so that you can see exactly what he is calling you to do. You can grasp the immensity of this glory, the way of life he has for Christians. Oh, the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him endlessly. It's endless energy, boundless strength. Paul prays two things for the Ephesians. He prays that people would come to know God personally. That's the first thing. And I just wanna say, that's why we stand up here every Sunday. It is not so that folks say, oh, that was a great sermon, or oh, that wasn't a great sermon, or oh, God forbid it goes too long. It wasn't for that reason. It is so that we can help you to come to know God personally. That is it, to keep a focused perspective on coming to know God personally. The second thing that he prays is that God's spirit would continuously give wisdom and revelation. So many times in this life, we feel stuck. We feel like we don't know what's next. We feel like we don't hear God clearly. But if you have the Holy Spirit, the good thing about that is he will give you the wisdom and the revelation that you need to grow and learn and connect with his word. And so if you're struggling a little bit with that, uh, Pastor Jackie teaches a Bible study on understanding the Holy Spirit and being sensitive to his leading. So if you don't know the Holy Spirit's voice or you don't know how to connect with him, I say talk to my Holy Spirit guru, who is Pastor Jackie, and she'll help you right along. It goes on to say he wants readers to know three realities about God. The clarity in God's calling, the riches of the life he has for us, and the incomparable greatness of his strength and power. God has called us each to something, amen? We're all called. When I first started youth ministry, I used to ask kids, or I think kids are used to hearing, what question? What do you want to be when you grow up? Right? But if you want to confuse a teenager, ask them, what has God called you to do? Ask your children, what has God called you to do? We, as Christians, we have to change the language. Not what you want to be when you grow up, but what has God called you to do? He has called each of us to do something specific. The reason why we have a debt crisis, a school debt crisis, a school loan crisis, is because a lot of us did what our parents said. Go to school and what? Get a good job. But if you went to school and you got a good job and it's not your calling, you're now what? Unhappy. And so the question is for each of us, not just students, not just youth, what has God called you to do? We all have a calling. We all have something that he has put us on this earth for. And the moment that you figure out what the calling is by being sensitive to the Holy Spirit is the moment that you start living a fulfilled, abundant life and you're able to keep a focused perspective. What has God called you to do? It says, the immensity of the way of life in Christ is glorious. I think that being a Christian kind of gets a bad rap in our culture, right? 
we're boring and we're stiff when we dance, but, but we're stiff and we're judgmental. And that's just not true. If we are in Christ, if we are looking as, as the church of Ephesians was, it is an abundance and vast and immense life, full of, full of life. And there is, it goes on to say, there is no one greater than him. No one comes close. No one. We should be in awe of that. No one comes close to Jesus. The question, as, as Pastor Gray asked earlier, is do we re really believe this is true? Do we really believe the word of God is true? Because if it is, we know that there's immensity in Christ. We know that he's called us to do something. And we know that there's no one greater than him. So no matter what we face, no matter what we go through, no matter what life looks like, Jesus is with us, amen? And so we have a hope. We have a hope. We're able to keep a focused perspective. And how do we do this? I believe that Christianity has a tilt to the future. Christianity, we can live in this moment, we can give honor to God in this moment, but the ultimate purpose of our faith is the future. We are living this life to live again. We are loving people so that we can live again. So when that coworker comes to you and she's yeah, 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 instead of snapping back, clapping back, you can practice discipline, you can practice love, you can practice humility, and you can live, navigate that because we are living to live again. It's not about this moment, it's about looking to the future. Every year that we live, every breath that we take, every, every move that we make, it brings us closer to an eternity with Christ. And if we can keep that focused perspective, then it moves us through this life. Verse 20 is about the resurrection of Christ. It says, all this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from death and set him on a throne in deep heaven. This is not saying that Christ was raised from a state of death. It is saying that he was raised out from the dead. That means he is the first of many who will be raised from the dead. So Jesus' resurrection is not an isolated event. What has happened for Jesus will also happen for us. There is going to come a day, there is going to come a time, again, if we believe that is true and we do not give up in this life, where we have an opportunity to be resurrected with Christ. And Paul really wants the Ephesians to understand this. If we really believe this is true, no matter what happens to us, no matter what happens to our loved ones, we know that we're going to be resurrected and we're going to see each other again. We have to keep a focused perspective. Verse 21 through 22 says, Christ is in charge of running the universe. Everything from galaxies to governments, no name, no power is exempt from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all and he has the final word over everything. I don't know what it was like for y'all growing up, but in my household, my mother and father were in charge of everything. They had the final word, they had the final say so, there was no universe. There was no galaxy, there was no name or no power that is exempt from their rule. If mama told me to clean up my room, guess what I did? Cleaned up my room. If mama told me to stop fighting with my brother or sister, I did that. And, they, and their power is, is human and it's only for a time. Imagine how much greater Christ's power is, how much greater God's power is. And it says that he has victory over everything, absolutely everything. The New Testament doesn't care much about the powers of this world. It simply says that they have been defeated. None of these things are in control or have control over the Christian. But yet, it has become the singular focus of the church. We are so concerned about governments, we are so concerned about names and powers. But what, Efe what Paul is telling the Ephesians is all of that has to bow a knee to Jesus. So I've had a lot of conversations this week about government and about laws and about rights. And for me, I'm just not that phased by it because I know that God has the final say so. And anything that's happening in America or any other country is going to have to submit to the rule and reign of Jesus, especially if the church will come together and stand in the truth and the power that he has for us, right? We can speak authoritatively with one voice. We shouldn't respond and react out of emotion, but biblically, we have power because of what Jesus has done. In verses 22 through 23, it says, talks about Christ's church and his body. And these are our last few verses. It says, at the center of all this, Christ rules or is the head of the church. The church you see is not peripheral to the world, but the world is peripheral to the church. 
The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts by which he fills everything with his presence. Everything is under the feet of Jesus. This, this imagery leads to the imagery of Christ being the head. If there's feet, there's also a head. And everything is under his feet, and he is the head. Christ is the head of all things for the benefit of the church. This gives the church a position of privilege because of Jesus. Now, in the last few years, privilege has kind of gotten a bad rap, right? It's been critiqued. Privilege is not, and people say, do I have privilege? Privilege is not necessarily a bad thing. For example, I grew up in a household with a father. That's a privilege. I am incredibly, some would say, overeducated. That is a privilege. There's, I have economics. I'm not living at the poverty line. That is a privilege. The question is, what do we do with our privilege? If we have it, how are we leveraging it for the good of others? That is the question. And so Paul is saying here that there, it's a privilege to be a part of the body of Christ. There's something that comes with it. This is the first use of the word ecclesia, which means church, but it will become a major theme for the rest of Ephesians. No other letter of Paul's is so specifically built on the theology of the church. The church is really important to Paul. A dear sister and seminary friend of mine named Lori, she put it this way. Ephesians is the guide or instruction for how we act in relationship with each other as the church. It's the picture of a description of how the church should look like when it's functioning at its best. The modern church has believed a lie. The modern church has believed a lie. We have been made to believe that we are an accessory to the world, that we are something that people can casually engage when they feel like it. So it's important to define terms. I've stood here before, Pastor Ben, Pastor Greg, we have all stood here before and said the church is not a building. Do I need to tell our neighbors? The church is not a building, right? We learned that during COVID. It is not even necessarily an institution. The church is a functional body of Christ. It is made up of many members. It is a global, eternal gathering of people that will never cease and nothing will ever stand against it. Yet we've allowed the idea of the church to be misappropriated. We've believed a lie. When people say, this, when people say it just boggles my mind, I love God, but I don't want nothing to do with his church. I love God, but I don't want nothing to do. We fall victim to this lie, to this misappropriation. I've come to tell you that you cannot have Jesus, the head, without his body. You can't have it, that's a, you can't have it. That's what I call a decapitated faith. You can't have Jesus without his body. Now don't mishear me. You don't have to come to this physical building. I miss you when you're not here. But you don't have to come to this physical building. But you have to be connected and gathered with believers who are seeking God, loving people, and doing his will. Anything that happens in this world, anything that happens in this world in conjunction with Christ is done through his body. So if something is happening and the body doesn't show up, what do we expect? Christ is giving us an opportunity to enter into our world and make a change. We can change this culture. We're not, it's not the earth, you know, the, the church is surrounding on the axis going around the world. No, 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 no. The world when it's good, when it's great. I have a friend who's, whose spouse is in another faith. And one of the things that they found was that whenever something good happened, in their lives, it was Christians who were there for them. It was Christians who helped them out. Again, we've allowed ourselves, there's, we haven't done everything right. Can we all agree as a church? As this church, we haven't done. But there is something to be said about what the Holy Spirit does, and God is inviting us as a part of his body to be a part of it. Anything that happens in the world in conjunction with Christ is done through his body. Now, most assuredly, there are parts of the body that need plastic surgery. Some of us need a, a lift or a tuck. And the good news is God has left us with a scalpel. It's his holy word. So if we want the church, this church, to be what he has called us to be, I can't hear from God. What do I say? If you can't hear from God, you need to read his scriptures because he's speaking loudly. This is the scalpel that's going to change and make an impact into the world. Okay, so what? We've, we've said a lot in these moments. We've said a lot in these last 20 minutes. And so I wanna sum it up in four points. The first being, we have access to knowledge and wisdom. 
We have access to knowledge and wisdom as believers, as the body, as Christians. We have access to knowledge and wisdom. Sometimes we see the spirit as only sealing and guaranteeing our salvation. Some people see the spirit as the means by which they run around the sanctuary and fall out. But the spirit also comes to help us gain understanding and deepen our relationship with God. It helps us to understand him. And because of sin, sometimes that understanding gets darkened. And many of us are going through so much. I don't wanna glaze over that. Many of us are dealing with so much. But the Holy Spirit comes in and he makes it bearable. He makes it navigatable. And if you are suffering in this season, I want to encourage and exhort you to connect, connect with God's word and listen and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. The second point is we can have the audacity of hope. We can have the audacity of hope. The world, the culture offers no basis for hope. No matter what the TV tries to tell you, no matter what Instagram tries to convince you of, and no matter what those 30 second videos on TikTok, try to show you the world has no basis for hope. Hope is a rare commodity. It was in the first century. The world has so many problems. We've got poverty, we've got crime, we've got racism, terrorism, abuse, addiction. We have a sense that we cannot solve our problems on our own individually or socially. It's meaningless. It, it sometimes feels as if it's all meaningless. Recently, I had a sister of mine reach out at 11 o'clock at night on Facebook Messenger. Her name is Jessie. She is a foster mom to nine kids, I think is what she has currently. So pray for Jessie, because uh, she clearly doesn't sleep if she's messaging me at 11. And so she was lamenting as to why we don't hear so much about hope from the pulpit, or even in Christian circles. We don't talk a lot about hope. And I think it's because so many people are overwhelmed in a post-COVID world. But God has built a bridge from a temporal lack of hope to an eternity full of actualized hope. We just have to keep a focused perspective. We can have the audacity of hope. The third point is we are co-heirs with a victorious king. We are co-heirs with a victorious king. Again, another reason for hope, Jesus is victorious over everything. This is good news. Jesus is victorious over everything. I know it seems kind of pie in the sky because many of us have bills that are due. Many of us are struggling from depression. Anxiety is the highest that it's ever been in our country, in our context. Our kids, it says, are suffering from disconnection and isolation. Every study shows it. Many of us are struggling under the weight of grief. Many of us lost people during COVID. If you're in my family, you lost multiple people. And yet, there is cause for hope because we are co-heirs with the victorious king. In the midst of this, I have two words, but God. But God, through Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he has placed all these things under his feet and more than we can imagine is under his feet. If we could just be like Mary and just sit at Jesus' feet and anoint his feet and just spend time with him, could you imagine how that shifts our perspective? It just shifts our perspective. Our perspective is gonna change. Life is hard, but it doesn't have to be heavy. We can give it to Jesus. One of the ways that I do it is growing up, one of my favorite, favorite gospel songs was by Dorothy Norwood. And it was, it, we sung it in church at Zion Grove Missionary Baptist Church in Carroll's Creek. And it said, victory is mine. Anybody know that song? Yes. Lisa, raise her hand. I'm going to sing it then, Lisa. It says, victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. I ain't going to sing the verse. Can I? Oh, okay. When I woke this morning, I didn't have no doubt. Anybody got a tambourine? I knew that the Lord would bring me out. So what I do? I fell on my knees. Cry, Lord, help me, please. And then what happened? I got up singing, shouting, victory. Oh! Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. If my sister's watching right now, she said that was not her key. That's okay. 
I'm going by myself, right? And so when I'm struggling to realize that I am a co-heir with a victorious king, I pull out some of those songs. You can't always listen to what the world is listening to. We've got to strengthen ourselves in the word, spend time with fellow believers, come join the choir if you want to sing with somebody. But, <laughs> but you have to connect to what God is doing and keep a focused perspective. Now for me, it's Dorothy Norwood. But for you, it could be anybody. We have to keep a focused perspective. There is cause of celebration in the fact that we get to, we get to be co-heirs with the victorious king. And the last point is we are a central part of Jesus's body. We are a central part of Jesus's body. We are not alone. You are not alone. No matter what your feelings tell you, no matter how the church, the little C church has disappointed you or hurt you, we are not alone. And the other good news is that we are never without Jesus. We are connected to Christ. He is the head and where the head goes, the body goes, right? The body has many parts and all of it moves together and with each other. So as long as you are a part of a body, this body, a body, we are going to be okay. You are going to be okay. A focused perspective on our hope in Christ, we will never lose sight of this. We're going to be okay. And this is all good news for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. However, there are some of us who don't. There are some of us who have heard what I've said and still aren't convinced or sure that they're gonna be okay or that this is good news. And I wanna say that there's room at the cross for you, right? There's room at the cross for you where the world is trying to make you think that it's the center. God is saying, no, I'm the center. And if you will follow me, if you will reach out to me, if you will respond to me, I want to do a work in your life. We have a reason for celebration. And Paul desperately wanted the Ephesians to understand that. He desperately wanted it. And if you are here on Mother's Day and your mama dragged you to church or you honored her by coming to church, this is also an opportunity for you to respond. God wants to do something in each and every single one of our lives. He has called us to something. If you're not sure of that calling, this is an opportunity as we sit together as a body of Christ to join. So if you would bow your head with me and let's pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful for your word. We are so grateful for your truth. We know that you are faithful. We know that you are good. We know that you have called us for a particular purpose. We trust and believe that your Holy Spirit is working to bring wisdom and knowledge to help us have hope, to remind us that we get to reign with Jesus forever, to remind us that we're not alone. Yet it is also true that this world tries to convince us of something very different. And so Lord, there may be those amongst us who do not know you or who do not believe that this is true. I pray that you would work in their hearts by the power of your spirit, that you would help us to come to know you, that you would help draw them to you by the power of your spirit. We know that it is your will that no man should perish. And so we pray, God, that the Holy Spirit would convict hearts and that we would be brought to repentance. And through that repentance, we would enter into a relationship with you or a renewed relationship with you. We know you have a plan for us and we know that you are faithful and that you are good. And God, on this Mother's Day, for those who are struggling, uh, because they may have lost a child or they may not be able to bear a child. God, I pray that you would fill their hearts and that you would fill the empty spaces, and that you would bring them peace, remind them that they're not alone and that you have so much for them and that we're living this life to live it again. Help them to keep a perspective. And for those moms who are with us, and today is a cause for celebration. I pray, God, that you would allow this, this day to be full of joy and full of incredible memories and that our children would honor our moms well. Lord, we love you. We are so grateful for you. We are so thankful for an opportunity to come before you and spend time with you and your word. We ask this, all of this, in your precious son, Jesus' name, amen. And if you would stand with me. Thank you again for joining us today. And so as you leave this place,
place that I get y'all, oh, I got y'all out, look. Okay, so whatever your restaurant is, if y'all wanna take me with you, just come up to the front. Uh, <laughs> I'm so grateful to have y'all join us. We will see y'all next week. Uh, may God go with you, may he be with you, may he be with you, may he make his face to shine up on you. Go in peace and, and enjoy this day with your mothers. All right, bye.